Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. I don't know about you, but I need a break from talking about like super expensive handheld PCs. So today we're gonna do a fast and fun video talking about something that's a lot cheaper and a little bit more fun. And that is, we're gonna be talking about the Mio Mini Plus. I got a bunch of these in the mail the other day, all the different colors that are available for it. And so we're gonna do a couple fun things here. First, I wanna do a comparison against the four different color options we have for the Mio Mini Plus. Additionally, I have the purple one here, and then also the purple version of the Ambernic RG35XX. So I'm going to compare these two in case you are interested in getting a transparent vertical model. These are the two to choose from. And then finally, if you have a Mio Mini Plus, I'm going to show you how to do multiplayer. This is one of the coolest features of this device because it is Wi-Fi capable. And if you're looking to play retro games in a two-player mode, this is one of the easiest ways you can do it. And so pretty excited about this one here. And without any further delay, let's go ahead and dive in. Okay, as we get started here, I wanna talk a little bit about what it's like to buy the Mio Mini Plus because you have a few options. And I feel like this is something I need to do with every one of these videos. To start, there is the AliExpress route, so you can buy it directly from Mio there. And this will be the cheapest way to buy the Mio Mini Plus. You can usually find it for about $65 when they have it in stock. And that's actually the main issue because as soon as they have one available, they usually will sell out within a matter of a couple minutes. And that's because there are bots buying it. And then also other people who have like stock alerts set up on Twitter. And so they immediately get it as soon as it's there. And so for the casual buyer, it's going to be very difficult to buy it from Miu directly on AliExpress. Now, some of the people who are buying them directly from Miu are then reselling them on eBay as well as on Amazon. And you can find them there. Typical price is gonna be about 85, maybe $90 per unit. So that's gonna be a 20 or $25 markup, but then also some of those ship with like Amazon Prime so you can get easy returns if there is an issue. And then finally, there is a third option to use distributors. So one of them that I usually work with is called keepretro.com. And they also have a markup, but it's not that much. So for example, it's $70 for the Mi Mini Plus on their website right now. And as of right now, they actually have all four models in stock. So if you ordered it, at least as of making this video, you should get it shipped out within a few days. And so this might be a nice option for you if you're not able to jump onto them when they're on AliExpress and you don't wanna pay the extra pricing on Amazon or eBay. However, there are two things I need to address when it comes to Keep Retro. Number one, they sent me these review units. So everything you're gonna see in this video came from them. Now, as always, I'm not getting paid to make this video, but all the same, I do use affiliate links. And so if you use the Keep Retro affiliate link down below, I will make a small percentage of that sale at no extra cost to you. And that's an easy way for you to support this channel, but of course you are more than welcome to buy them elsewhere as well. And also I'll leave a non-affiliate link down below as well if you'd rather click on that. Now, the second thing I want to address with Keep Retro is some of their policy issues. And so I learned about these after I'd made my last review. And there's two things that happened regarding their policies. Number one, when they first had the Mio Mini up for pre-order, they got a bunch of orders in. But then all of a sudden, Mio had a hard time fulfilling all of those supply requests. And so there was a longer delay in actually getting the device out. And after all that time, there were some people who requested cancellations. And I think that is totally fair. If they said they were gonna deliver it on time and then they didn't, you absolutely have the right to cancel if you want. Now at the time, Keep Retro had a policy and it wasn't on their website that basically they were gonna charge people a cancellation fee. And this was to recoup costs when it comes to PayPal, but all the same, it wasn't in writing. And so I learned about this on Reddit and people were sending me emails. And as soon as I heard about it, I reached out to Keep Retro. After all, I have links from my own videos directly onto their website. And I said, hey, I don't like the fact that you're charging a cancellation fee or that you're not even putting it in writing that that's gonna happen if somebody does do a cancellation. That is not the norm when it comes to buying a retro handheld. And in the interest of disclosure here, I did tell them that I was going to end my partnership if they didn't make a change. And to their benefit, they actually did. Instead of just putting it in writing, they actually just waived the whole cancellation thing altogether. And so now, theoretically, if you try to cancel pre-order from keepretro.com, they should not be charging you any sort of fee. If they do, let me know. I'm gonna put my email down below and you can just let me know if they've been doing that and I will get back in touch with them. Now, as these units finally started to ship, another issue came up with their policy, and that was that if people had a defective unit, Keep Retro was requiring them to send them back on their own dime. And so, for example, with some of those early units, they were having issues where the screen wasn't staying inside the device, and all of a sudden, you're gonna have to pay something like $30 to have it shipped back to China just for them to send you a new unit or to give you a refund. And again, as you can imagine, I don't think that's very cool. You shouldn't have to pay upwards of 50% of the price of the device itself just to get a replacement. And then also, if people were able to show video evidence that their device was defective, for example, the screen was popping out, then Keep Retro was only giving them like a $5 refund for their time, not the full refund of the device. 
And so again, I got in contact with Keep Retro. Bear in mind, this is like a couple month difference between these two issues. And I said, hey, I really don't like this policy here. You guys are not giving a fair value to your customers. And honestly, a lot of this has been weighing on my mind. I have found that over the past few years as being a YouTube channel, that a lot of creators and influencers, when they get to a point where they don't like what a company is doing, they just kind of go scorched earth, where they basically say, you know what, I'm never working for you again. This company sucks. And maybe they make a reaction video. But honestly, that's not really the way I want to do things. After all, it's very hard to buy a device from MiU on AliExpress. And I also don't like the idea of encouraging people who are using bots or scalping and then paying an extra amount just because they're able to get on it faster. And honestly, when all is said and done, I like having a solution that's a third-party supplier like Keep Retro. The idea here is that they can take in a bunch of pre-orders and then buy them in bulk from Miu and then sell them at a small upcharge to the customer. And I think that's just a better way to do business, especially if Miu can't keep up with demand and I don't like paying money to scalpers either. And so like I mentioned, all this was weighing on my mind when I sent that email to Keep Retro where I was basically like, hey, you need to change this policy or we're gonna have to find a different way to buy a Miu Mini Plus. And to their benefit, Keep Retro wrote back and said, we will change our policy. So the new policy should be, and this is on their website now, that basically if you have a defective part in your unit, so for example, the screen is falling out, they'll send you a new screen. Now, if there's something completely wrong with it, like it's broken or whatever, they will send you out a new console or they will give you a full refund if you request it as well. And so personally, I'm happy with the solution. I like the fact that we have a third party seller and now they have policies that I think are in line with expectations of customers as well. And of course, like I mentioned before, there are many different ways to buy a Miu Mini Plus. You can go ahead and get it from Miu if you're fast on the take, but then also you can get it from Amazon or eBay if you don't mind paying that extra cost. Either way, this is going on longer than I thought it would, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about what it's like to buy a Miu Mini Plus, at least right now and here in May of 2020. And again, I will have my email down below. So if you run into any issues in the future with Keep Retro, please let me know. I think this is part of holding a company accountable. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, now let's go ahead and compare all the different color options we have for the Miu Mini Plus models. Okay, and so here are the four color options that we have right here. Starting on the left, we have the gray model, then white, transparent black, and transparent purple. And beyond just the colors, there are some other subtle differences. For example, on the left side, you can see that the D-pad, the menu button, and select and start buttons are all gray on the gray and white models. And then of course, you can also see that the face buttons are different. So you have a rainbow pattern here with the white and transparent black models. And it looks like the purple buttons that are on both the gray and the purple model are the same. It is kind of hard to tell just because the purple case does make those buttons look a little bit pinker. Now between the two transparent models, it looks like the purple one is more transparent than the black one. So that's really gonna come down to personal preference and how transparent you want your device to be. Another thing I noted is that the two models on the left have a little bit different texture on their plastic compared to the transparent models. And bear in mind that because these are brand new units, they might wear down over time, but as it stands right now, both the gray and the white models have a little bit more texture to them. It's almost like the plastic has a bit of a more powdery feel to it when you rub your finger across. Meanwhile, both the transparent models are a little bit more slick. And I've had the transparent black model for a couple months now, and these both feel to be about the same amount of smoothness. And really when it comes to appearance, other than the colors, that's really the major difference between these four. When it comes to the feel of the buttons and the D-pad, all that other kind of stuff, yeah, it feels exactly the same between these four models. However, there are a couple other things I wanna test. For example, we have LED lights at the top of this device when you turn it on. And so what I wanna do here is turn them all on and then turn off the studio lights just so you can see how much light bleed you will get with the transparent models. And this is a very similar experience to the previous Miu Mini models. Those ones had a transparent blue model and that that one had a much brighter LED. And as you can see in the footage here, the purple one, which replaced the blue one here, also takes up that mantle of having the brightest LED. However, you might really enjoy that nostalgia of having like this bright glaring LED in your face while trying to play a game. And of course, with the solid models, when you're actually playing the device, you won't really even notice it at all. So obviously it's gonna be up to you when it comes to light bleed, but for me personally, I think the transparent purple one is just too bright. Okay, looking at the back here, we have a very similar design for all four of them here. And again, the transparent purple model does look a lot more transparent than the black one. Now, one of the things that bothered me about the original Mio Mini was just how easy it was to take off this battery cover on the back. Thankfully, I can confirm right here that all four of these back compartments are really sturdy. And so it's not gonna be a problem on these models here. And really, I don't wanna belabor the point too much. Here are the four colors and you can see them here with my green mat and maybe one looks more appealing than the other. And honestly, it was very helpful for me to get all four of them in the studio. And that's because I ended up picking a favorite among them and it wasn't the one I was expecting. 
In fact, for these models, I expected it to be the transparent black one, but no, it's the retro gray. Part of that has to do with that textured plastic. I really like the feel of that, more so than the kind of slick plastic that you have on the other transparent models. And then additionally, I don't know, I think that gray color is really starting to appeal to me at this point. Anyway, if I had to pick between the four which one to take to a desert island, it would be the retro gray one right here. Okay, and really briefly, let's do a comparison between the transparent purple model of the Mio Mini Plus and then the Ambernic RG35XX. Now, this isn't going to be a comparison of the two devices themselves. I did a full video about that a couple months ago. And I'll leave that link down below if you are trying to decide which model is best for you. Either way, here's a look at these two different models. And even though they are both quote unquote transparent purple, there is a night and day difference. I think part of that has to do with the intense colors of the Mio Mini Plus. Not only is it more purple, but it's also skewed a little bit more towards pink than purple as well. On top of that, it has a blue PCB, which I think just accents those colors even more. Meanwhile, the Ambernic RG35X has a more subtle and dark purple to it, and that is offset by the white PCB. And honestly, between the two, I think the Ambernic one has a more classic and accurate look to it overall. And so if you're only looking at color here and you're looking to replicate, say, for example, the Atomic Purple Game Boy Color, then I think the Ambernic is going to be the better choice here. The Mio Mini has got a kind of neat color to it, but it doesn't associate it with the Game Boy Color, at least for me. Okay, moving on, we're going to talk about how to get multiplayer working on the Mio Mini Plus. And in order to get this working, we're going to use a feature within RetroArch called NetPlay. And let me give you a quick breakdown of the requirements for this feature. Number one, both of these devices have to be very similar to one another. They have to be running the exact same version of RetroArch. And they also need to be running the same version of the same emulator core as well. And then finally, both consoles have to be playing the exact same content. And so it's not just a matter of both of you having a copy of Super Mario Kart. You have to have the exact same ROM between the two devices. Now, these restrictions do limit what you can play with the Mio Mini Plus. After all, this one uses a special version of RetroArch and then specially built RetroArch cores as well. And so really, the only easy way to play against a Mio Mini Plus is with another Mio Mini Plus. And then of course you'll have to be using the same version of firmware as well. For all my testing here, we're going to be using Onion OS. I just recently did a video about this and so I'll also leave this link down below. Either way, what I've done with all four of my Mio Minis is loaded them up with the exact same version of Onion OS and then put on the exact same ROMs as well. Now, even with all of those parameters in place, there are still some limitations. For example, RetroArch NetPlay is not capable of emulating the Game Boy or Game Boy Advance link cables. And so unfortunately, that does mean that you cannot trade Pokemon between two different Mio Mini Pluses. And then additionally, the multiplayer aspect caps out at below PS1, so you cannot use multiplayer with PlayStation 1 games. But even then, with these limitations, there's a lot of systems that we can play. For example, 8-bit and 16-bit home consoles, as well as some of your favorite arcade games. And we're going to test all that here in the rest of the video. Now to get set up, there are two things we have to do behind the scenes before we actually start up a game. Number one is we need to turn on the Wi-Fi. So we're going to go into the settings menu right here. And then the third option down is going to be your Wi-Fi selection. I've already gone through and picked my home Wi-Fi and entered my password. And you can tell it's working because I have the Wi-Fi symbol up on the top right. Next, in the version of Onion OS that I'm working with right now, I have to make one other change within RetroArch. So to get there, we're going to go into the Apps section and then find RetroArch and then open that that up here. And within here you can see that there is the net play section. We'll get to that later when we actually start playing a game. For now we need to make one adjustment to the settings. So go ahead and navigate to settings and then press A and then scroll down to the saving section. And within this menu you need to turn off the auto save state option right here. Now bear in mind that by turning this off you're going to disable auto save states. That means when you close out of a game it's not going to save it automatically. Instead, you'll have to do a manual save. So here's the hotkey menu right here. You'll need to press on that center menu button and then R2 to save a state. And then when you start up the game, I think it's going to auto load your save state. But if it doesn't, then you would press menu and then L2 to load that state. Last thing here is we need to save the configuration file. So we're going to back out to the main menu and then go into configuration file and then press save current configuration. And so that's going to disable auto save state anytime we open up RetroArch. Okay, so now we're ready to give it a whirl. Like I mentioned, I already have the exact same ROMs on all four of these units. So let's go into the NES section and pick a multiplayer game. We're going to start with Contra. Now when you're playing multiplayer, one of these devices will function as the host device. And I'm going to do that with the black one here. So after booting up a game, I'm going to press the menu and select button to bring up the RetroArch Quick menu. Within here, I'm going to press the B button to back out to the main menu. And now we're going to go into the NetPlay section. And the first option that we have right here is to host. And then again, our first option says start NetPlay host. 
And all we have to do at this point is just press the A button again. This will boot us back into the game and also restart the game. And it'll give you an indication that you have joined as player one and that you're waiting for another client device. So let's go ahead and boot up Contra on my other Mio Mini Plus, which is connected to my home network. And then once I'm in the game, I'm gonna hold on to the menu button and press select. And in the RetroArch quick menu, I'm gonna press B to go back to the main menu. And then we're gonna go into net play. Now this time we're gonna go down to the bottom. It says refresh net play LAN list. This is going to search on just your home network for any connected device. So this is what you would wanna do if you're playing in the same house. Now it is possible to also play over the internet. That's what the refresh net play host list is right here. And if I click on it, you can see there's a bunch of different options. Now this is spread out across all of RetroArch. So this could be people that are playing on their computer or a different device. Either way, we're gonna stick with our local network. So we're gonna go back to that LAN list and then I'm gonna select my Mio Mini. What'll happen there is the client device or the player two device is gonna boot into the game and it's gonna sync up with player one. And that's really about it. At this point, the emulator thinks that you have two controllers plugged into the system. And so you can start up a multiplayer game on the NES, just like how you did back in the day. And I'm gonna do two things right here. Number one, I'm gonna do some tests so you can see the latency between the two. So I'm gonna jump around and shoot my gun and things like that. But then also I'm gonna kind of explain this so you can kind of frame your head around how this works. The way I like to think about it is that both of these screens are basically acting as the same television. And so if you remember back in the day when you had an NES plugged into a TV, you would have your two controllers and your both staring at the same screen. And that's kind of similar to what's happening here, but both players are staring at the same screen, but on two different devices. Another thing to note is that if one of these devices gets disconnected, what'll happen is the one that is still connected will just take over. And if they were player two before, they are now gonna be player one. Of course, it's gonna be a little bit weird because the player two is just gonna kind of sit there at that point, but essentially that's what's gonna happen if one of them loses connection during the game. All right, let's do a little bit more testing. So next up, we're gonna do the TurboGrafx-16. And for this, we'll play the game here called Aero Blasters. And it's gonna be the exact same process here. So on the left one here, I'm gonna open up the RetroArch menu. I'm gonna go into NetPlay and then Host and then Start NetPlay Host. It's gonna say I've joined as player one. And then on the other device, I'm gonna go into the RetroArch menu again. And this time when I go into the NetPlay section, I'm gonna refresh the LAN list. I'm gonna find my Onion OS device right here. And then once I press A, they're gonna sync up and we're good to go. From there, you just wanna select a two player game. And just like that, we are now playing Aero Blasters in two player mode. Now, of course, don't pay any attention to what I'm actually playing on the screen right here. This really hurts my brain to try to play two players at once. But as you can imagine, if I had another person here in the studio with me right now, then we could both play the same game right here. Now there is one system that's a little bit problematic just here in this latest build of Onion, and that's gonna be any of those Sega systems that use Pico Drive as its core. So that's gonna include Sega Master System, Genesis, Sega CD, and 32X. And what's gonna happen here is they can connect no problem whatsoever. However, once you are connected, it's not going to detect the second player's controller. And this is really just a configuration thing that needs to be fixed within Onion OS. But of course we can manually do it ourselves, so let's do that real quick. What we want to do here is press the select and menu button to get into the quick menu and then go into the core options section. Within here, scroll down to the input section and as you can see, the input device two doesn't have anything assigned to it. And so on both of your two devices, change this over to a six button pad. From there, all you have to do is just back out of the quick menu and resume your game. It'll save it automatically. And now as you can see on the left one, it is detecting a second player input. So let's go ahead and do that on the second device. Again, we're gonna go back in that same menu and then change the input to a six button pad. And then as we back out into the game, you can see that both of them now have the second player selected. It'll take a moment for them to sync up, but once they're good to go, we can start up our game. And so here we are, Streets of Rage 3, playing on the Sega Genesis with a two-player mode, and yeah, it's a lot of fun. Another system that works really well is going to be Neo Geo. So if you want to play any of those arcade classics, you can totally play them right here. And it's great because this catalog is just ripe with a bunch of two-player games. You know, fighting games, shooters, things like that, a lot of fun here. For example, you could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with your loved one in a fighting game, or maybe you can co-op together in Metal Slug. Now, after doing all this testing, I started to get really ambitious and I thought, okay, let's do a four player game next. And of course, one of the best ways to play four player games is gonna be with an arcade system. And so here I am with all four of my Mew Minis plugged into the same four player version of X-Men on the arcade. And this is using the default MAME 2003 Plus core. However, I found that when trying to host a game with this core, it would actually freeze the device up. And so unfortunately, at least with the default arcade core, it looks like you cannot play multiplayer games. But thankfully, Onion OS comes with a bunch of different arcade cores, and there is one that works really well. So let me show you how to install that one real quick. 
We're going to go back into the main Onion OS menu and then go into the app section. From here, we're going to go into the package manager. And then once you have that booted up, you're going to press the R2 button a couple times to get into the expert section. And within here, you want to enable the final burn Neo core like I have right here. And I've already done this, but basically all you have to do after that is just press the start button twice and you're good to go. After that, you're going to want to turn off your device, take your SD card, put it in your computer, and you'll find a Final Burn Neo folder within your ROMs folder. And from there, you're going to want to put in Final Burn Neo compatible ROMs. And of course, do the same thing for all the other Mio Mini Pluses that you have so that they're all compatible with the same core and same ROMs. After that, when you're back on your device, you'll find that the Final Burn Neo core is not located within your game's directory. And that's because this is what they call an expert core, so you have to enable that first. So this is pretty easy. We're going to go back into the app section, go into the tweak section right here, and then within that, the third one down is called user interface. Go ahead and jump into there and then turn on the show expert mode option. Now when you back out to the main menu, you will see that there is an expert section. And if we go into that one, you can see here is the Final Burn Neo core. From there, it's going to pick up on all those games that you put in the Final Burn Neo folder, and you can boot them up just like any other game. Now if you want to play four player arcade games, there's one extra step that we have to do, but it's very simple. And that is when you have your host device, which I'm going to use the purple transparent one right here, when you get into the net play section, the second option says max simultaneous connections. All you have to do here is just change it to four so you can enable four Four different players to play at once. And that's really it. All you have to do now is just start the Netplay host. And as you can imagine, we have to go through each of these other devices and go into the RetroArch menu, then go into Netplay and search for our device within the LAN network and then open it up. And as you can see, as I start connecting each of these one at a time, they're starting to sync up with that host device. And so here we are, we have four player Simpsons running here on the arcade. And the four player version of this one is pretty unique because basically whatever number player you are is which character you're going to get assigned. So if you are going to play this game with four players, you all have to figure out which player you want to be ahead of time. Either way, here we are all set up with four player gameplay. And I think this is pretty awesome if you ask me. Now there are going to be some limitations. For example, the Miu Mini Plus can't really handle all this information going back and forth. And so I would expect some slowdown and stuttering between these four devices. Now, of course, bear in mind that as you're playing this, all four of you are not going to be looking at all four screens at the same time. So while there may be lag every once in a while on one of these devices, overall, it's still a pretty nice experience. And the way I see it, if I was going to play this four player game with like my family, I think that the overall novelty of just playing a game like this on these tiny little devices just kind of overshadows any sort of lag you might experience. Either way, if you want to have pitch perfect four player gameplay, you can do something similar to this, but with more powerful consoles. And I've also noticed that some of the lighter end arcade games, you know, something like Gauntlet does play a lot smoother when you're playing four players. So you may want to hold back and not play something that's quite as labor intensive as The Simpsons or even the X-Men Arcade. Now for me personally, seeing a four player X-Men Arcade like this really fills me with nostalgia. This is one of my favorite arcade games when I was a kid. And so it's super cool to be able to see this like that. But of course, again, you will experience some lag. And so you just kind of have to be a little bit forgiving as you're playing it. And finally, the last system I wanted to touch on is going to be Super Nintendo because this one does require a bit of a workaround as well. For example, if you start up with the default core within Super Nintendo, you can start up your host application. However, when you use your client device or your second player device, when you try to refresh the LAN list, the other Mio Mini will show up, but it won't allow you to connect to it. Instead, it'll give you an error that says no core found. Now, luckily, this isn't the end of the world. All you have to do here is just use a different RetroArch core. And I found that this one right here, SNES 9X 2005 Plus, works really well. And so it's going to be very similar to how we set up Final Burn Neo. But the nice thing about this one is that it'll actually pull the same ROMs from your Super Nintendo folder as your default core. And so you don't have to add any extra games to it. You just have to add this one extra app right here. And then, of course, once you have that set up, you can go ahead and connect and it's going to have absolutely no problem getting connected. And so here we are playing Super Mario. Mario Kart in two-player mode, and that's super cool as well. And of course, it is going to show split screen because it was split screen back in the day on the TV. Either way, if you do want to play multiplayer Super Nintendo, it is absolutely possible, but you have to use that one specific core. Okay, and really, that's about it for this video here. I wanted to show you how to set up Netplay on the Mio Mini Plus. Personally, I think the Wi-Fi connection on the Mio Mini Plus is one of the best benefits of this new upgraded console. Yes, it can only play up to PS1, and yes, it's a little bit bigger than the original Mio Mini, but all the same, with Wi-Fi, we have a lot of different options. Not only can we do multiplayer like I showed in this video here, but we have the ability to connect for retro achievements as well. And if, like me, you prefer to use a custom operating system like Onion OS, this one is also capable of over-the-air updates. And so really, once you install this onto your card one time, you never have to do anything else again. From 
from there, you'll be able to update it directly onto the console without having to take the card out. And they've also got some other great options like FTP. So if you wanted to transfer files onto the device without taking out the card, you can do that too. Either way, I think this is a pretty exciting feature of the Mio Mini Plus, and I'm really happy to have tested it out. Anyway, let me know what you think in the comments below. Is this a pretty cool feature, and do you plan on using it? As always, thank you for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.